You are listening to a podcast from Essendon Presbyterian Church in Melbourne, recorded 10 a.m. on February 11, 2024, presented by Rev. Chris Duke. Uh, turn our attention again to God's Word. We're going to read this passage from Romans, which was mentioned in the video. The first seven verses of Romans 13. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the, th the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves, for rulers are not a terror to, to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister for, to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, custom to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. May the Lord bless to us the reading of his word. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we consider this passage, we pray, Lord, that you'll uh, open it up for us, that you'll give us applications and understanding, Lord, so that we can be effective witnesses in this world for you, that your kingdom may be advanced. And so, Lord, may your Holy Spirit now present to us your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. An officer of the Federal Police Force arrived at a regional farm and talked to the farmer. He told the farmer, I need to inspect your farm for illeg illegally grown drugs. The farmer said, okay, but I want to warn you, don't go into that top field over there, pointing to the location. The police officer responded in anger, look, mate, I have the authority of the federal government with me. So he reached into his pants pocket and removed his officer's badge and proudly displayed it to the farmer who was also the landowner. Do you see this badge? This badge means that I'm allowed to go wherever I want on any piece of land. No questions asked or answers given. Have I made myself clear? Do you understand? The farmer politely nodded, apologised and went about his work. A short time later, the farmer heard loud screams and looking up, saw the officer running for his life. He was being chased by the farmer, farmer's prized Dittman bull, Bodacious. With every step, the bull was gaining ground on the officer. And it seemed likely that the bull would bowl him over before reaching safety. It was clear that the police officer was terrified. And the farmer threw down his tools and ran to the fence and yelled at the top of his voice, Your badge! Show him your badge! In former days, a particular characteristic of Australians was an honest but discourteous and arrogant disrespect for authority. Perhaps that really hasn't changed. Rebellion, rebelliousness has been part of human character, of course, since the fall of man. And so as we come to Romans 13, 1 to 7, we, we find actually here somewhat of an interlude in the topics that we've so far been studying as Paul addresses the issue of submission to authority, especially government authority. This is one passage in scripture 
that talks about how the Christian is to relate between the church and the state. And of course there are a number of different views that have arisen to express how the state and the church are to relate. There's one view that says the church ought to be over the state. There's another view that says the, ch the state ought to be over the church. And there's another view that says the state establishes the church and the church declares certain responsibilities to the state in order to stay in favour and power. And then there's a view, and this view has been held during most of Protestant history, that the church and the state are distinct, that they are actually partners in cooperation for the good of the state subjects. Well, we're not going to discuss these views this morning. That would take far too long. And please note that in the book of Romans, it was written around the uh, 60s AD. If you then consider that the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, in the New Testament, depending on your end time interpre interpre interpretation, many believe, of course, it was written in the middle 1990s AD. In Revelation, the view of Rome here, though, as a nation and as an empire is more negative than what we read here in this passage in chapter 13. The church, when Revelation was written, was under intense persecution, which leads us to the question, how are we to consider the difference when we look at the characteristics between Romans and Revelation? And so in my sermon today, I want us to, to consider three things. Firstly, we should appreciate what Paul says here because it, it, it is written to actually help us Christians to live in the social and the cultural time that we find ourselves in. And secondly, what Paul says in Romans 13 helps us to know how to pray for our city, for our, for our state and nation, for our government, for the culture, for our community and for our unbelieving fellow citizens. And then thirdly, what Paul teaches us here shows us how we're to engage as Christians in our own time, today even, 1900 years to almost 2,000 years after this book has been written with society and the culture in which we live. Now back in December 2022, I was an invited guest of two of Moira Deeming when she was sworn in as a state politician in the upper house, state legislator. And when she took the oath of allegiance to the Crown, which every elected member should do, of course today some members, especially of minor parties, have watered down their oath, but here some and Moira swore their allegiance to a higher authority as they swore their oath on the Bible. Now I received this week a notice of how the Prime Minister of the, of the country that's north of us, Papua New Guinea, affirmed that the Bible was God's authoritative inerrant word as he called for a national day of prayer. Would it be that our Prime Minister would do the same? Amen? For believing politicians, they, for those who believe in Christ, who take this position, that they are under God, that they are responsible to God first and secondly to the Australian people. And so when you read Romans 13, 1-7, you might get the impression that it's calling believers to give an absolute unqualified submission to government authority, no matter how evil, the government might be. Does this pa passage actually say that Christians will under no circumstances ever oppose the Hitlers, the, Stalin, the Stalins, the Chairman Mayos, the Pol Pots or any other tyrannical despot that has ruled throughout human history? Is Paul saying this here? No, he's not. But what Paul does say should be read and understood to be very helpful 
to all of us in our society today, in our culture today, because, friends, our culture, our society has been changing. It's not the way it used to be. My children, as they grew up, they often heard me use an expression. As they got older and a little bit more brazen and cheekier, they would lovingly mock my expression. They would hear me talk about how things were when I grew up, how things were when their mother grew up, and going back even further, how things were when their grandparents grew up. They would often hear me say, back in my day, this is what happened. Our world today is not the way it used to be. And maybe things will never change back to the way it used to be. Now I'm thinking and considering the changes that we've seen in cultural, moral and spiritual issues. Our constant prayer is for spiritual revival and we'll keep praying for revival but in regards to the work of the Holy Spirit, the wind blows where it blows. For God is sovereign and the work of the Spirit is sovereign. But if our Christian influence is diminishing, God is saying, Paul is saying, Christian, do not be discouraged because God is sovereign and he's appointed you for this day. He's appointed you for today to be a positive influence just like Esther was called in her day for such a time as this. Then how should we live? What are we to do? And Paul gives us wise response to our changing culture. And then he directs us in wisdom in how to pray and in how to engage in society. Paul first gives us wisdom in how we respond in our culture today as he directs his words firstly to Roman believers. As you can contemplate his words, they are liberating for the Christian not enslaving when we talk about submission. When he calls believers, when he calls Christians to acknowledge the authority of government and to respect the authority of government. And Paul's purpose isn't to consign Christians to absolute submission to unjust tyrants, but to alleviate consciences of the inevitable challenges that Christians face in all societies. Now, Paul was in Rome when Nero was emperor, when Nero was Caesar. Just imagine the ethical challenges that Christians would have experienced then. And you're a Christian and you might live in Asia Minor or you might live in Spain or Gaul or even in Great Britain or, in this case, in Rome. And you ask, should I pay taxes? Are not my taxes going to a government that is persecuting fellow Christians? Surely it's wrong for me to pay taxes because my taxes prop up a military authoritarian government that's persecuting fellow believers in Christ. And then if you come to the conclusion that you shouldn't pay taxes and you don't pay taxes, you become the object of even more aggressive persecution by the Roman authorities. What Paul is saying here, Christian, don't turn yourself inside out with this question because its end is a never-ending question. Understand that in all human societies, all governments, even good governments do not do things, sadly, that are immoral. And if Christians don't pay taxes because of immoral decisions and actions, you'll never pay taxes because you'll never find a perfect government in any country in the world today. And not paying taxes may be happy news for some of you. Many of us agree that we would spend our money better than government often spends it at times. However, not paying taxes puts Christians into a very difficult situation. And Paul is saying to these early Roman Christians, don't back yourself into a corner where the only response against government is actually to come out fighting. You see, he wants these Christians to live in peace. As a Christian, 
you in fact do have liberty. Because our God is actually sovereign over this government, over this mighty empire that you live in. You don't have to stress where every dollar of tax is going or whether being submissive to the government is furthering the aims that are contrary to the, to the Christian cause because God still is in control. And Paul is saying this here to alleviate a Christian's conscience not to burden them. And the Roman Empire was not the only unjust state that's mentioned in the Bible. As read to us from Exodus 1, a new pharaoh, a new king arose who commanded the Hebrew midwives to put to death all Hebrew newborn boys. Did the Hebrew midwives follow Romans 13? Did they respect the Egyptian authority of of the Pharaoh and obey and put to death the male children of the Hebrews? No. The Hebrew midwives defied Pharaoh's authority and God commends them for it. Moses commended them for defying Pharaoh's authority. Moses, of course, was a beneficiary of their defiance, was he not? And Pharaoh, who is worshipped as a god, declares his will for male Hebrew children to die. And these Hebrew midwives, these slaves, of course, they stop the will of a supposed god of Egypt. God is actually mocking Pharaoh in that story. Pharaoh, you're a god, but I'll choose some slave women to hinder your will to show that I indeed and the true almighty God, the true sovereign God. So here is an example where they are not required to submit to what the government tells them to do. And as we read the book of Daniel, we find another example of when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego under Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar under him they were required to bow to a golden image of himself. And, of course, these three young Jews, they they refused and they were thrown into a fiery furnace. We know the outcome was very positive for the three young men. And then Daniel, he came under another king, Darius the Mede, who commanded that no one should pray to anyone except to him. But Daniel continued to pray in his usual way three times a day, morning, midday and evening. He prayed, of course, to the living God. Was he violating Romans 13? No. And then in Acts 4 and 5, the Jewish leaders in the Sanhedrin commanded Peter and John not to preach in Jesus' name. But Peter replied, we must obey God rather than men. Now, in all these circumstances, godly believers defied wicked, despotic authority. So Romans 13 isn't the whole story. and We have to include all of what the Bible says concerning the believer's response to government to get the complete picture. But here Paul says, Christians, don't back yourself into a corner. In the next few weeks, we'll find out more about what's happening to Christian freedom in Australia. When the report from the Australian Law Reform Commission is released, concerning uh, most uh, uh, that's on my heart, the employment of Christian teachers in Christian schools. And soon we'll learn what the Commission of Productivity has to say about tax exemptions to charities and religious institutions with the likely removal of tax deductibility, especially for uh, religious building funds in schools. This is a real situation and it's likely that laws in this area will change, are going to change. And in our minds as Christians, can I be involved in supporting a government that does things like this? But Paul says, Christians, don't back yourselves into a corner too quickly. Now, in the examples given earlier, where believers defied unbiblical authority, notice what was objected to. 
with the Hebrew midwives. It was the issue of murder. We're told not to murder. And as a believer, your response of no to murder is a correct response. The second issue with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego was the issue of worship. We're told not to bow down to any graven image. And saying no, I will not is the correct response. And the third was an issue of prayer. You are not to pray to the one true God. And your response is, yes, I will, is the correct response. Or preaching. You will not preach in the name of Jesus. Yes, I will preach in the name of Jesus. They're all situations where direct commands are given to believers to violate the fundamental teachings of God, as we find in his word. In those situations, we must say, I must obey God rather than men. But Paul is saying to exercise wisdom. Don't be too hasty to oppose every injustice that is performed by a government that otherwise will never be able to live and belong in any country in the world. Now, we know in our democracy that we have, we, we can oppose, we can voice our objections. And at this point in time, we're not thrown into prison. The day may come when that circumstance may change. Who knows? And so first, Paul says in verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And then in verse 7 it says, Render therefore to, to all their due taxes to whom taxes are due, and so on. How then do we learn how to pray from this passage? Firstly, as Christians, we know that we're to pray for those in authority over us, for government authority over us. Paul in First Timothy 2 verses 1 to 2 tells us to pray for kings and those in authority. You see, God has instituted governmental authority. We not only pray for those in authority because God says, we pray also out of neighbourly love. And in a democracy where we may strongly disagree with government policies that conflict with our beliefs, our Christian beliefs, we told to pray with those whom we disagree. There are fellow citizens who hold positions of authority. We're called to pray out of love for them, respecting their person. It's not always easy to pray for someone that you strongly disagree with. But the second great commandment is invoked here, isn't it? To love your neighbour even praying for the well-being of those who disagree with you. Now, this doesn't mean that you lay down your ideals and your principles. It is God who determines what is right and wrong. And we serve God, not man. Therefore, in serving God, we will oppose all who undermine biblical and the moral standards in our society, who fail to uphold justice for the unborn, who, deter, who undermine religious th uh, liberty and freedom, who condone an ethos that is actually hostile to the gospel. And friends, this is subtly happening today. And we'll continue to pray for God's purposes to triumph over the plans of those who consciously and or unconsciously undermine the gospel. In the meantime, we will show a genuineness of Christian neighbourly love, even for those we don't agree with. So thirdly, how do we engage in our culture today? What does Paul teach us here in Romans 13? Well, firstly, do not withdraw. We're not to withdraw. In our discouragement concerning the state of our nation, it's tempting to withdraw even in despair, do not withdraw. In fact, we should work towards getting to know our neighbours and showing them Christian love. If ever there was a time not to withdraw, that time is today. We need to reach out and show Christian neighbourly love. And secondly, 
Stand on your Christian principles and convictions, even if it costs you. There will be increasingly a cost as our culture moves away from our Judeo-Christian heritage. We've already seen some who have lost employment because they dare to profess the name of Christ. Thirdly, don't assume that your children will agree with you, but explain to them the biblical basis of your ethical convictions. And likewise to your grandchildren. In the process, don't get angry if at first they can't see or understand your views. And the only way, dear friends, is to inculcate the next generation is strong biblical convictions when you carefully, clearly, biblically and persuasively present why you hold the moral principles that you hold and the biblical views that you hold. You see, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against every power from on high that is not working for God. But God is the strong one. Remember that we are on the winning side. Don't become indignant when you're younger, when a younger person today questions traditional marriage as we know it, as what the Bible teaches, and we think it's the only way. We know the arguments, don't we? We've heard them all before in recent times, more so. We've heard that, uh, you know, aren't you being a little narrow? Aren't you discriminating against people when you hold your narrow views of the Bible? Isn't love, uh, you know, love is love, we hear. Don't you love people after all? Friends, we need to clearly articulate the biblical position on sexuality, on marriage and on gender and on these key moral principles to the next generation. Otherwise, the next generation will go the way of the world. We need to articulate it clearly in the church. Don't stop praying for our nation and don't disengage from the political process or the culture. As Bible-believing Christians, we're already in a minority in the political process today. Thank God for Christians in the past and thank God for Christians even now in our land who have engaged in the political process very easy to be discouraged and to stop praying for our culture and to, and to stop engaging in the political process. Friends, don't do that. Why? The early believers in Rome whom Paul wrote this letter were initially a very tiny group, were they not? And they were living in the thick of the most powerful polytheistic empire in the Western world. But friends, within 200 years, they turned it upside down. Don't be discouraged and don't stop praying. Don't stop engaging in the political process or the culture. In fact, become more informed about what's going on in the world today. Be prepared to engage in the cultural and political process and disagree with those dominant voices who denigrate biblical truth with clear, powerful arguments, with passion, with intelligence and with persuasion. But don't do it with hatred or disrespect or condensation. We need to assume that our culture isn't in agreement, isn't in agreement with us anymore and you won't win the culture over by hating it or hating the people in it. You win the culture by persuading it. But you won't persuade anybody with condensation and disrespect. We want to persuade people. We want people to understand what we think and believe. We're not name calling. We're not denigrating. We're engaging in rigorous, intelligent disagreement. 
which is the bedrock of our democratic society. But the language of denigration and condescension and hatred should be far from us. But when it ends, friends, we know that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Therefore, we engage with some confidence in the political process because it doesn't matter how long it takes. Finally, determine to view yourself more than ever as a citizen of another kingdom. As Christians, our hope is looking for another city, is it not? Which has its foundations, whose architect and builder is the Lord Jesus Christ. This current world is not our home. We're not home yet, friends. So as we engage with great love for our nation, we knowing that ultimately we're seeking another country, a heavenly one. As our hopes and dreams are deeply impacted by what goes on in the world today, we should weep tears when his word is denigrated and we should sing songs of praise and songs of joy when God is glorified. We should care about the things that happen in our culture but remember that we're citizens of another country, a country where God is always honoured and Christ is always loved and proclaimed. So, friends, as you consider the world today, I want you to think positively, even with the evil that we see around us, even with the laws that have been changed in recent times, that are against God's word, ultimately we know who wins. God wins. Jesus wins. But in the meantime, let us pray for those in authority over us, that we might live lives peaceably and so that the gospel can still be proclaimed and expanded. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you all these words and uh, of uh, Paul and Lord, we pray that you'll continue to uh, help us to meditate over them and to see how they might apply in our lives. Lord, help us to pray for those in authority. Help us to respond positively with our views in love and help us to engage in a positive way in the political process in our society today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. More messages of hope at Essendon Presbyterian Church.org.au or wherever you get your podcasts from.